Father, we thank you once more for the privilege of having these meetings. We thank you that you have made all the arrangements and we're just following your lead. Help us to understand what our part is. May we study, may we meditate, may we hear your voice. We thank you now that we may read some of what you gave Alan White to preserve for us. May we see the importance of it. We thank you now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Just our ages, we're looking at the chapter, the Sermon on the Mount. Of course, we're drawing from other parts. We're drawing from the Bible and the prophecy. But this is the place we're looking at to stay organized. I think we left off about page 311. The reason that I remember that is because that particular quote is one that I have observed through the years, and I mean since I first started doing this, that people sit back and wonder, now wait a minute, how do I do that? As a matter of fact, after reading that quote years ago in in Washington at the other end of it, a woman stood up and she didn't like it one bit, that quote. And she said, she was a young woman too, and she stood up and said, oh, give us hope. <laughs> it just absolutely threw her. She thought that's an absolutely impossible thing that Ellen White said. And she was blaming me, but I wasn't me who said it. It was Ellen White. And I just looked at her and I said, Sister, you know, if I knew you were doing something that would get you lost, and I told you how to remedy it, I would consider that hope. <laughs> if I leave you alone in your deception... That is not giving you hope. <laughs> and she got real quiet and just said that. <laughs> I said, we're talking about genuine hope here. We're talking about the truth. Okay, so maybe I should uh, read that again just to let you know what it was that uh, got that reaction from her. Desire of Ages 311. You might want to memorize this one sometime just so you have it at your fingertips and somebody is talking to you about something. <laughs> God's ideal for his children is higher than the highest human thought. Okay? Than the human thought can even reach. Be ye perfect. Ah, uh, uh, there's the rub right there. Be ye therefore perfect even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And, of course, when people hear that, they say, Oh, now, who can do that? Well, obviously, what Jesus was saying can be done. We need to understand, what is he saying? <laughs> He's not telling us to be God. That would be crazy. <laughs> he is not telling us to be God. But he's saying that we can do something the same way that God does something. And we need to find out what he's saying. What is it we can do that God does? <laughs> so, the next sentence says, This command. Did you know it was a command? He was not making a suggestion. He was not giving us some options and some alternatives. He was making a command. Be, therefore, perfect. <laughs> If, I don't know. I've never talked to a person yet who thought Jesus was giving them a command. He was just kind of saying something. <laughs> no, it's a command. And so we have a commandment from God, from Jesus. It says here, this command is a promise. Well, that puts a whole new different light on things. He didn't say, you do it. He says, I promise you, you will do it. How can he make that promise? There's a condition. 
if we meet the condition, he promises that we will do what the Father does on our level. So let's keep reading here. The plan of redemption contemplates our complete recovery from the power of Satan. Now, doesn't that make sense? Why would God work out a plan of salvation where he only deals with part of the problem? <laughs> Why would he do that? I mean, don't do anything if you're going to do that. So God, God's plan is complete, and the devil knows that. It's complete, complete recovery from Satan. Okay. Uh, Christ always, there goes those absolutes again, always separates the contrite soul from sin. Now, that is also misunderstood. People read that and say, oh, he's going to help me overcome my cherished secret sin that nobody knows about. That's not what that says. Because God is not going to pick sins to deliver us from. He's not going to do that. <laughs> He's not going to say, oh, you have that one. Okay, we'll work on that. Oh, you have that one. Oh, we'll work on that one. Then. No, he never does that. What God does is deal with the whole problem of sin. Period. To get rid of the whole thing. So we don't have the problem that has dominion over us. Okay? So it says Christ always, that's the only plan of salvation he has. He always separates the person who has a problem with sin from sin so now they don't have that problem anymore. And he always does it. Always. He came to destroy the works of the devil, and he has made provision. There we go. He has made provision that the Holy Spirit shall be imparted to every repentant soul to keep him from sinning. Now, that's just the outside of what sin is. See, to keep him from sinning. And just in case we missed what she was saying, she continues on now. And this is the part where she's going to start with today. The tempter's agency is not to be accounted an excuse for one wrong act. So when Satan says, you do this, or you do that, or your old habits say this, or whatever, she says, hey, that doesn't count anymore. It doesn't work anymore. If you use that as an excuse, you're going to sin. That's the only possible thing you can do, is if you excuse it, you're going to do it. So she said, we must not uh, use an excuse for one wrong act. Satan is jubilant. Now, does anybody here want to make Satan happy? <laughs> I didn't think so. <laughs> Satan is jubilant. When he hears the professed followers of Christ making excuses. So, wouldn't, isn't that a strange picture? A Seventh-day Adventist redeemed, delivered from sin person who is a Christian wanting to make Satan happy by making excuses. That's a picture, isn't it? Why should a Seventh-day Adventist even think about making an excuse for sinning? Why? Only unbelievers do that. And I could see people actually wince when I read the next sentence. Yeah. In audiences, I could just see them. A holy temper. <laughs> A Christ-like life is accessible to every repenting, believing child of God. And I've had people come to me after the meeting where this was read, tell me, man, I can't overcome my temper. I say, wait, you better go back and read that sentence. A holy temper is accessible to every repenting, believing child of God. So then, 
There's another sentence added here. Jesus said, be perfect like the Father. Now, she she's right. As the Son of Man was perfect in his life, so his followers are to be perfect in their life. So now she has made it very practical. You don't get to see the Father doing his thing, but we see Jesus. And that's what it says in Hebrews. We don't see the things that are being talked about theoretically, but we see Jesus. Well, when we see Jesus, we know what a perfect human life is. And so we say the same thing. Well, wait a minute. I can't do what he did. Well, you can do the human things he did. You can't do the God things he did. But you can do the human things he did. Okay? Now she's She's going to make this so practical, we have no place to go, we can't hide. Here she goes. Jesus was in all things made like unto his brethren. Now, who are his brethren? Christians. They are his brethren. The, the drunk laying in the gutter, they're an absolute mess. Is not his brother? You see, the universalists like to make Jesus the brother of every human, no matter how horrible they are. That's not true. Now, he loves everybody, and he's made provision for everybody, but he is the brother of the redeemed because he, he is making them like himself. So it says that in all things he was made like under his brother. So are we in that category? That means that if we're brethren, we should be able to do the same things he does. <laughs> we're kin. We're kinfolk. <laughs> we're brethren. We're in the same family. We have the same father. We have the same inheritance. We can do what all of our brothers do. <laughs> okay? So that sense is loaded. We could spend some time there, but let's let's see where else he's going here. He became flesh even as we are. What kind of flesh is that? Yeah. There's no such thing on this earth as holy flesh. You got to A Christian does not have holy flesh. That is one of the things that people tried to invent during Ellen White's time, saying, well, I'm sanctified now. I'm holy. I'm holy. No, you're not. Jesus is holy, and as long as you have him, you have the hope. You have the hope. But you are not holy flesh. You are still <laughs> the same kind of flesh you had when you were born. The only thing that's changed is your mind. You have a clean spirit now. Okay? But your flesh is still... <laughs> it gets tired. It gets hungry. As a matter of fact, that's your next sentence. He was hungry and thirsty and weary. See? That proves he had our flesh because that's what ours does. <laughs> now then, at this point, we could spend a lot of time discussing the difference between... Jesus as a human and us as a human. Because although he had our flesh, he did not have our sinful spirit. He had a pure, holy spirit. Okay? So Jesus was not just like us in spite of what lots of people say. He was a pure, holy being in the likeness of sinful flesh. And there's no contradiction of saying he had both of those at the same time because that's what a Christian is. A Christian is a person who still has sinful flesh, but they have a cleaned up mind because of Christ. He has given them a new heart, a new mind, which is like what he had. Only he had no bad habits, and we have bad habits. So, there's no place where he was actually just like us, but he was a real human. 
Okay? He was a real human, but he was also divine, so we can't just talk about his humanity by itself, because it never existed by itself. That's not possible. He was always divine, human, combined. All right, so let's go on now. He was sustained by food, refreshed by sleep. He shared the lot of man, yet he was the blameless Son of God. When did he start being the Son of God? There are lots of people who think he became the Son of God when he was made a human. But that's just not so. It's really not possible. Because Jesus, as the Son of God, was sent by the Father to clothe his divinity as the Son of God with humanity. So he was the Son of God before he became a human. That's very important to get that across to people because most people don't know that. And when you say he was the Son of God from eternity past, now you have something to deal with. Because if he was the Son of God way back then, before creation, then how did he get to be the Son of God? <laughs> See? And most people never think about that because they think Jesus has always been because that's what the churches teach them. But there is no Bible verse for that. The Bible says he was the Son of God and that means he was born sometime, somewhere that we don't know about. But we don't have to know about it. God never has to explain that to us. He just has to tell us. He's my son. Isn't that enough? Isn't that enough? He said, that's my son. Now, did he ever say such a thing? This is the way you talk to people because you get their brain thinking and thinking. And they say, well, he did, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, he did. So, yeah, he really did. As a matter of fact, three times before the cross, Desire of Ages 625, three times before the cross he said it. The Father came to this earth personally to say to the human race, This is my Son. <laughs> this is my Son. Now, are we going to say, Well, God, I think you're a little confused here. You, you can't have a Son. <laughs> That's exactly what the theologians all over the world throughout history have said. God, I'm sorry, but uh, we know you're fooling us. Yeah, we know you can't have a son because deity can't be produced. We know that. It just is. Well, that's not the Bible. That's not Christianity. That's Plato. That's Socrates. That's men's foolishness. Let's just say, Stay with God's words, and here we have it on, in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is talking, and Ellen White explicating it. She says, Jesus is the Son of God. Of course, Matthew 3.17, God said it himself. So that should be enough. Now then, she's ready to tell us now what Jesus meant when he said, Be perfect as your Father is perfect. Here she comes. His character, the character of Jesus in the flesh, is to be ours. So now we know what Jesus said. He said, you be like God in your character as he is in his character. Now we can do that. Yes. We can be more than sincere, we can be committed. We can decide and never bend. Your character is the only thing that's going to take you to heaven. Did you know that? There's nothing else about you that's going to heaven except your character. And you cannot have your character given to you. Oh, there was a fellow who got so upset with me when I said that in a meeting. He said, but in Desire of Ages, I said, it's a gift. I told him, well, yeah, but you better keep reading. Because he gives us all the provisions for it as a gift. 
but we have to earn our character. And so I I had to, in front of that whole group, come up with an illustration because he was really making a scene. <laughs> he said, no, it's a character. I said, well, I'm sorry, but do you have it? Do you have the character of God? Because he gave it to you. And he, I said, you don't have it because you expect him to give it to you, and he's never going to do it. You better get this figured out. Suppose that I'm going to a university and I know they have finals for all the courses. And I'm diligent in going to school and studying and doing everything they say. But two weeks before the final, I get sick. Really sick. And I can't even get to the finals. I'm so sick. Let alone study for them. <laughs> So, after all of this time and all this study and all this effort, I've been wiped out by sickness. I cannot get to my finals. I can't take them. I can't study for them. What am I going to do? Well, I haven't figured out. I'm going to ask you to take my finals for me. <laughs> yeah. Would you do that for me? You take my finals and I'll be okay. I haven't gone to school for three years to get to those ones. I haven't studied. I have no idea what the teacher said. I have read not a single book. How am I going to take your finals? Well, just take them. What good is that going to do? I do not have your mind to work with. And that's exactly why God can give us character as a gift. It's got to be our mind based on what we have learned, what we have decided, what we have lived, and what we know. And nobody else in the universe is like that except <laughs> me. <laughs> so God can only take my character to heaven if I'm going to go at all. And she says here, our character must be the same kind as Jesus. Now we have something to work with. Because we can do it. We can have our individual, unique character, but it's the same kind that Jesus had. And that's what we want. So we are starting to learn some things that are very important. It says, the Lord says of those who believe in him, and that's who, those who receive him, I will dwell in them. Who? How do you make that work with the Trinity? How can a Trinitarian say, I believe Jesus lives in me, he himself. They can't say it. The Trinity doesn't believe that. The Trinity says the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are inseparable. That's a basic teaching of the Trinity. So if Jesus lives in me, there has to be the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit living in me. The whole God is inside me, according to the Trinity people. So Jesus shouldn't have said I. He should have said we. You see what's wrong? Jesus never talked like a Trinitarian because he wasn't one. And Ellen White never talked like when she's writing this book and she says, he says, I will dwell in you. There's no way you can get Trinity out of the spirit of prophecy. There's just no way. It is absolute foolishness to try to take some statements and pervert them and misuse them and misquote them. To come up with something that Ellen White never believed and the Bible never says. So we need to spot all these things that they're everywhere. I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God. Oh, so Jesus is our God. He's our creator. They shall be my people. We are his church. Okay? So Jesus is everything to us. 
The Father has handed all of us over to Jesus to say. And Jesus is the only one who can get it done. She talks a little bit about the ladder that Jacob saw. And of course, Jesus is that ladder. And the angels walk up and down. I hope you have the quotations put together about Jesus being the only way that God communicates with us. He's the ladder. He's the only communication. But the angels walk up and down that ladder. So they're part of the communication. They bring the Spirit of the Father to us. They bring the Spirit of Jesus to us. They're involved in as big a way as can be. But it's Jesus. We mustn't, it's always Jesus. That's why that first love is important. If we lose that first love, we have lost the foundation of the whole gospel, of everything. We must have that first love constantly. He, she says it this way. If that ladder, <coughs> which reaches from here to there, to the throne of God, if that ladder had failed by a single step, just one step missing, by a single step of reaching the earth, we should have been lost. So the work of Jesus is perfect. It's absolutely perfect. If he misses one little thing, it's all gone. He took our nature. That was one of the big steps. He took our nature. So, when Jesus is walking around the earth, when people looked at him walking around there in that, those, that Palestine area, do you know of anybody that pointed to him and said, Oh, look, there's the perfect man. Did anybody ever point to Jesus and say that? Oh, look, there's the perfect man. Why not? Because he looked just like everybody else. <laughs> there was nothing to look at and say there's the perfect man <laughs> so if he looked like us he's proving something that people that look like us can live like him <laughs> that's Romans the 8th chapter she's, she's heading a lot of ground here and she's dealing with the Sermon on the Mount. He took our nature and overcame that we, through taking his nature, may overcome. So there's a meeting of the natures. He took ours, we take his. And that's exactly why he came, was to give us his nature. So there's only one plan of salvation. 